Hi guys, and welcome back to Let's Make a Redstone Computer. Last episode, we built an instruction memory, which allows us to store a program in Redstone. Today, we're gonna to build a new component to make it much easier to run these programs. But first, there are a few things I wanna talk about regarding last episode, cause I got a lot of questions in the comments. First off, no op. Some of you guys asked why no op is even a thing, because it seems like a pointless instruction. Well, no ops are useful when it comes to the timing and alignment of instructions. Let's say you want instruction B to happen three instructions after instruction A, but you don't want anything else to happen in between them. In that case, you can just fill in the space in between with no ops. In general, as processors get more complex, having complete control over the timing of instructions becomes a lot more useful. Another thing you guys pointed out is that no op doesn't have to be its own instruction. For example, you could just do add r0 r0 r0. Register 0 can't be written to, so this behaves exactly the same as a no-op. In fact, you could even go a step further and make the assembler assemble the word no-op to add r0 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 in machine code. Then you could still write it as no-op in assembly, even though it's not technically a real instruction. This is a perfectly valid option, and it would essentially make no-op a pseudo-instruction. A pseudo-instruction looks like a real instruction in assembly, but it actually isn't. Notice how in this scenario, no-op looks like a real instruction, but in machine code, it's an add. The reason I made no-op a real instruction and not a pseudo-instruction is because I feel like it's cleaner and more elegant. It uses another opcode unnecessarily, but I personally think it's worth the sacrifice. And like I've said from the beginning, this series is opinionated, so if you make your own computer, you can obviously make your own decisions. The other thing you guys commented about was the assembler. If you go to the GitHub repo in the description, use the assembler, and paste the schematic in, you'll notice that the bits are completely rearranged. The assembler doesn't work on the world download from last episode. This is because the repo in the description is all based on the final computer, which I actually already finished and made a video about. Throughout this series, what I'm doing is building up this computer a second time, so it's not going to look exactly the same, and thus the assembler might not work. So if you want to run a program for real, you'll have to do it on the final computer. Just go to the repo in the description and follow the instructions on the readme. I also have a section on my Discord server dedicated to the computer, so you can go there if you run into any problems. And when it comes to the world downloads of these episodes, I recommend only looking at them as a display. Alright, let's finally get started with today's stuff. The first thing I want to do today is revisit our instruction set. As we continue to add more instructions and make our computer more complicated, this control section is going to get really overwhelming, and it's not the main focus of what I want this series to be about. So I'm just going to remove it. I want it to be obvious enough from the diagram to infer how each instruction is executed. So on that note, let's recap how every instruction so far is executed. No op looks like this. The register file is not enabled, so nothing gets written and the instruction does nothing. Add looks like this. Registers A and B get read, the ALU adds, and it gets written to register C. Subtract, XOR, AND, NOR, and right shift are all very similar to add, with the only difference being the operation in the ALU. And then load immediate, or LDI, is the new one. The data going into the register file becomes the 8-bit immediate, and the destination becomes register A. So in this example, LDI R27 puts a 7 into register 2. Let's also get a refresher on what our assembly programs look like, without the computer. Here's a simple program that calculates the first five Fibonacci numbers. If you didn't know, the Fibonacci sequence starts with 1, 1, and then the next number is the sum of the previous two. So 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, then 5, 8, etc. This program starts by putting a 1 into register 1 and a 1 into register 2. Then it adds R1 plus R2 into R3, 2 plus 3 into 4, and 3 plus 4 into 5. As you can see, when it's over with, register 5 has the fifth Fibonacci number. So as our Minecraft computer stands, we can execute a program by doing the following. Assemble it, paste it in, and go through each address one by one, pressing clock to execute each instruction. But this is tedious, and it always follows the same pattern. So let's make a new component to help automate this, called the program counter. The program counter stores a single number, and its job is to keep track of where we are in the program. Specifically, the number it stores will be the 10-bit address of the instruction that is currently being executed. This output wire just shows what the number is, so if it's currently storing a 7, then the output shows 7, and then the input doesn't really do anything until you press clock. Pressing clock writes the input to the memory. For example, if you put in 3 and press clock, it writes the 3. So the program counter is essentially a single register. In fact, some computers just use one of the registers in the register file as the program counter. For us though, it just makes more sense to keep it separate because it holds a 10-bit number, whereas the register file holds 8-bit numbers. Now, since the address goes up by one as you execute a program, 
Let's add one to the address and plug it back into the program counter. That way when you press clock, it counts up by one. Notice how if I start at zero and start pressing clock, it updates to one, then two, then three, etc. And then let's plug this whole thing into the instruction memory. So now, here's how running a program will work. Let's run this Fibonacci program for example. We'll start by putting the program into the instruction memory as normal and set the program counter to zero. To execute the first instruction, send a clock pulse to both the program counter and the register file. We can do that by connecting them into one button and just pressing that button. Notice that this both executes the first instruction and counts up by one on the program counter. So we're already ready to execute the next instruction. You can just press this button four more times and it will automatically execute the next four instructions. But even this is still more manual than it needs to be. As you might have guessed, the reason these red signals are called clock is because now we can hook up a clock to it. There's no need to manually press the button five times. Let's just reset the computer and have the clock run the program for us. But this creates a new problem. How does the clock know when to stop? We could make it end when it hits the first no-op, but then we couldn't have a program like this because it would stop before the end. Instead, let's make a new instruction called halt with opcode one and mnemonic HLT. When the computer receives a halt, it will stop the clock and therefore stop executing instructions. Let's put a halt at the end of the Fibonacci program, reset the computer, and start the clock again. Now it runs the program and automatically stops when it reaches the halt. Beautiful. All right, let's catch up to the diagram in Minecraft. I'll start by building a program counter. Like I said, it's basically a single register, so it's actually pretty simple. You can just put 10 repeater locks on top of each other, all connected with a clock signal. If you put in seven for the input and press clock, it writes a seven. Or if you put in three and press clock, it writes a three. Then let's use an adder to add one and loop it back into the input. Here I'm using a carry cancel adder, but any adder will work just fine. Now when you press clock, it counts up. One, two, three, etc. By the way, since this whole thing is essentially a counter, I should mention that there are lots of different ways to make redstone counters, and most designs don't even need an adder. For example, in LRR number eight, I showed you guys this tiny design for a counter. It's only eight bits and not 10 bits, but I feel like it's important to mention here. Again, just check out LRR number eight if you wanna learn more about it. Let's go ahead and plug this whole thing into the instruction memory and reset the program counter to zero. Then for the clock, I'm gonna use this circuit right here. When you press the start button, it starts running, and it sends out a two tick pulse every 100 redstone ticks, and pressing stop just turns it off. This circuit works by making a comparator cancel itself after a long delay. If you wanna learn more about it, then check out LRR number seven. Now let's just hook this up to the clock signals on the program counter and the register file, and let's make it so that when the opcode for halt is detected, it comes over here and stops the clock. Now, I made the clock 100 redstone ticks because I know for sure, without even counting, that 100 ticks is much longer than any instruction could take. So there's no way that the clock is too fast. But it's definitely not as fast as it could be. If you wanted to find the fastest possible clock speed, you would just need to count how long the longest instruction takes and set it to that. This brings up an important point about our computer. Our computer is classified as single cycle because every clock cycle executes exactly one instruction. This is, in my opinion, the simplest way to design a computer. But it has the disadvantage that you are only as strong as your weakest link. The time it takes to execute the longest instruction is the time it has to take to execute any instruction in order to make the clock speed consistent. So even if 99% of your instructions are lightning fast, if you even have one slow one, the clock is slow. In theory, you could make a clock that changes its speed based on the instruction, but this is generally frowned upon because it makes the timings unpredictable. Most computers, both in real life and in Redstone, are not single cycle. Instead, they're multi-cycle, breaking the instructions up into many clock cycles. For example, you can make a computer that breaks instructions up into three separate stages. Maybe one to fetch the instruction, another to decode it, and another to perform an operation on the ALU. Whatever they may be, if you break instructions up like this, then the computer would take three clock cycles to execute an instruction. Why would you want to do that? Well, it actually allows the computer to work on multiple instructions at once. Notice that after the add instruction moves from stage one to stage two, the computer could also start working on a subtract instruction in stage one at the same time. Then as the add moves to stage three and the subtract moves to stage two, it could work on an XOR in stage one. This is called pipelining, and it's an extremely powerful tool to make computers faster. As you can see by this graph, executing an add, subtract, and XOR with a three-stage pipeline takes five cycles, 
Whereas if you did each instruction individually, it would take nine cycles, three plus three plus three. But again, none of this even matters for our series because our computer is single cycle. There's no pipelining. Every clock cycle executes exactly one full instruction at a time. All right, now that we're caught up to the diagram and I'm done with that tangent, let's run this Fibonacci program for real. If we built everything right, then all we have to do is assemble it, paste it in, and start the clock. About a minute later, we can see that the clock got stopped by the halt, and the registers have one, one, two, three, five in them. Perfect. Like I said earlier in the episode, this series is somewhat opinionated, and if you want to go into computer science like I did, it's important to learn from many different sources. That's why I recommend Brilliant, who sponsored this series and made it possible. Brilliant will go way beyond my videos and teach you about computer science, math, and whatever other nerdy topics you're into. Just like building Redstone, their lessons will teach you hands-on problem solving, because they always include interactive content. This means you'll be playing with the concepts yourself, so you'll have more fun and you'll build critical thinking skills instead of just memorizing. One of the courses that demonstrates this really well is called Exploring Data Visually. It has really great visual models on algorithms, regression models, and more. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash mapbatwings or scan the QR code on screen, or you can visit the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription.